our presentation up. And starting now. All right, so this is a uh, slightly different format. If you've been to one of our recent program overview webinars, we're going to be taking a different tack here today and talking about why you should pursue a career in cloud computing, what it is about this particular sector that gives you exciting opportunities really for a high paying and a fast growing career. So. I'm here today, um, we're, we're going to be talking about cloud computing, careers in the field, opportunities for you. Uh, I'll be asking some questions toward the very end after the Q&A, but we'll talk about one of our cloud computing certification programs at that point. Do put your questions into the Q&A within Zoom, and uh, Greg and I will be able to address those later in the session. And I uh, want to let Greg introduce himself um, as a uh, our resident expert today. Uh, we had scheduled for Matthew David. Unfortunately, he was not able to attend, but Greg has admirably stepped in, and um, he will be a great expert in this area for you. <laughs> no pressure, Stuart. No, yeah, no, no, no pressure at yeah. all. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so basically, I've been working in the uh, computing field for, I don't know, like 30 plus years, I suppose. So starting off like in, in super minis and mainframes years and years ago, but that transitioned pretty quickly into all of our equipment got available over the internet or what was the fledgling internet. So I fortunately was able to be around when the first AWS uh, resources were made available to just normal people, normal businesses got involved in that, did a lot of training on a lot of different technologies in those days, but also a lot of deployment and development work for mostly small and middle-sized businesses at first. And then later in my career, I was doing more like Fortune 500 companies when we would be talking about what's the best way to take legacy application development and migrate that into cloud-based application development, both as a brand new starting application and also how to migrate those applications to cloud that we had already been developed. Uh, going along with that was all the people who are using those applications, people like business analysts and, and marketing folks and salespeople, <clears throat> operational people, and understanding how to train them to make the best use of this new technology, new way of doing things, new way of thinking about things. So I was fortunate to do that. And then I got hooked up with Simple Learn a few years ago. Most have been working with Azure, uh, AWS, and big data programs, and a little bit of the analytics uh, analysis programs for Simply Learn. So it's exciting to work with them. It's exciting to, to work with the uh, students who are just getting started or trying to reskill themselves. So uh, uh, yeah, I've been in a lot of different roles, so I've got a lot of uh, info when Stuart's ready for me to dump it, so. Right, and, and we'll get started with that right now. We're going, uh, I'm gonna let Greg, uh, address you about the cloud computing sector. Yeah, so uh, uh, I'll just run from this slide here. I'll try not to read the bullets per se, but basically the origins I kind of in intimated a little bit earlier is that back in the day, you know, it was mainframes. Everywhere was mainframes. The mentality was build the applications, put it in this big, this big piece of iron in a data center somewhere and share it with everybody. And that worked pretty well for a long time, 60s and 70s and so on. And of course, IBM was a big player in that, the, in that space. I particularly worked at a company called Digital Equipment Corporation. I was a senior engineer, I was a senior trainer, I was a senior consultant with them before I left. And they had uh, what's called the PDP 1170 series and the VAX VMS environments. And those started making a lot of headway into businesses to make it a little easier, quicker to adapt and put applications out in front of the business people that needed them. Um, that evolved pretty quickly into the internet when 
uh, company, if you've heard of AWS, decided to make some of those data center resources available over the wire. And all of a sudden you were dialing in somewhere to try to get to your compute, trying to get to some storage and so on. And of course that took off like crazy. And uh, I don't know, if, Stuart, you need, do you need anything? Are oh, you just breathing? Okay. Oh, I'm so, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so, I, so I meant to mute myself. No, no, that's okay. No, no, that's okay. So, so in the in that time, I'm not going to say it was super exciting. It was more politically heavily charged because what they were competing with was I had a training company at the time training. And I was teaching NetWare, which was real common to make distributed computing available in a business. And then Microsoft came along and they started reproducing Windows. NT and Windows NT was the beginning of the Microsoft uh, evolution into workspaces to migrate all your applications to a shareable platform. Amazon came in on top of all that and said, hey, why don't you just use the compute resources we have in the cloud? It's on demand, it's cheaper, it's easier to deploy, it's easier to manage, all of that. Of course, that won. So AWS is now what they are today. And, uh, and they've been matched up by Microsoft's Azure uh, Google plays in the space with GCP, and then uh, IBM's got Bluemix, although I don't think they're doing quite as well as IBM would like. So when I worked with IBM recently, they have made the wide decision very often to just leverage the AWS platform with the IBM resources that they use. So there's three big, big players now, uh, well, four including legacy technology, but in general, as I moved through my career learning all of this stuff, I didn't, I didn't want to work with legacy technology any longer other than to help move it, move it to cloud. That's all I wanted to you know, do. So, so you had to pick a cloud, AWS or Azure. So when I'm teaching courses for Simply Learn, I like to make sure students understand the pros and cons of each. Don't get too married to one or the other because they're, they're equally balanced in a lot of ways. There are some things that are better than others. And for someone who's getting into business, you want to be able to take a fair and balanced approach to what's the best place to put some, some applications, some data storage and so on, even up to and including, do I wanna keep it in a legacy data center? And if so, why? So all of those things would feed into the various types of, of uh, technologies that would be used. For, for example, the software as a service that might get, be utilized, where you're just going to pick a, a software package like Salesforce or ServiceNow. There's some very major platforms that a lot of companies use, and those are two of them. Uh, the platform as a service technology, which is the technology that are provided by both, actually all three major clouds. You can use them as a platform and minimize your management effort. And then of course, you can say, hey, I just want some, some infrastructure. I just want some compute. I just want some storage. Until recently, you had to use the virtualized version of compute and the virtualized version of storage and so on. But the bigger clouds have now made actual hardware available in cloud like some of the earlier adopters of cloud technology. So as a specialist or as a cloud computing uh, engineer, you have to know a little bit about each of the things I just talked about. You don't have to be expert, but you should kind of know where they fit. And then anything as a service is just whatever they dream up next. And if you go, and if you want to find out about the news about how, how to do that, you can go to the, the events that the major players hold usually a couple of times a year or more. Or you can read about it in a lot of the, ma the magazines that you see here. InfoWorld's a great resource. You don't have to subscribe to it necessarily. They have a lot of online resources. Wired Magazine, you can go there. Network World, CIO Magazine. And by the way, you don't have to be a CIO to get CIO. So I've been getting CIO for years, and I've never been a CIO. So there's a lot of different resources that are available, and Google Search is your friend. Uh, in the classes that I teach, I'm almost constantly... If I say a new word, a new technique, I'll whip out a Google searched uh, location on the web that explains what that is and why you might want to use it. Because there's a, there's a new word for almost everything almost every day, it seems like. So uh, in the area of news, there's a lot of ways of, of staying up to date. Of course, one of the best ways is to make sure you have you take periodic training. So as I said, I, I took, when I first started, I had, it seems like I had training, I don't know, for a year and a half, two years. The just, just pure training at technology companies. And I took some courses in college. And uh, the, the, the training that I found was the best was the ones that had to do with hands-on things that I would actually be doing in, in the workplace. So that's where I usually encourage people to get training from. And then, of course, there's all sorts of folks out there who, 
who you might look up to or follow on Twitter if you want to. I don't know how often Larry Ellison tweets, but um, some of the things that's on the sheet there you see are are kind of interesting to read and think about as you get further into the technology space. So cloud computing is not only the future of computing, but the present and entire past of computing. Of course, Larry's a you know multi-billionaire, so you got to kind of take what he says into consideration. Um, Mark Benioff from Salesforce, and again, Salesforce took over their space. I mean, they're so good at what they do. It's a great company to work for, by the way. But he, uh, Mark Benioff said that cloud services companies of all sides, the cloud is for everyone, the cloud is democracy. And that's pretty true. Most of the things that you wanna use as a Fortune 1000, Fortune 500, you can use as a small business. You can use at home as someone who's just learning. You can get a big data cluster. You can do heavy duty analytics. A lot of the things that these big companies do you can do on your own. So it's really, it is really a democracy. And then the last one there, the um, from Deloitte. Deloitte, of course, is one of the big accounting firms. There's several of them, Deloitte, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, what's another one? Well, just those two I'll start with. So this one is, uh, the, it says the cloud's effect within the business world may be relatively clear, but its impact on society is just starting to be understood. Now witness the whole controversy with chat GPT right now very controversial and who drives that cloud what in cloud drives that big data and massive amounts of compute and storage drives that whole chat gbt thing so the leaders therefore have a responsibility to recognize the implications and help sure they're they're, they're addressed properly and of course chat gbt is a good example of something we don't really know if we even want to do it or not but we're doing it anyway and in terms of the the acceleration since i started in this i remember like Amazon was happy to sell a little bit of compute in S3 back in the early 2000s. And now the SaaS market alone, Salesforce, ServiceNow, businesses like that, is expected to grow over 430 some odd billion dollars next year. So you're, and year after that, the PaaS market platform as a service where you do a bit more work, but you get a lot more flexibility, is slated to see a jump to 88.1 billion in 2025. And when Gartner, when Gartner jumps in, if you don't already know this, you really should pay attention to what they say. Because when they say they predict the spending on public cloud, it's going to jump from $242 billion to $692 in public cloud. They're saying that based on a significant amount of research, uh, querying CIOs, querying the leaders in the business field. So a lot of times, if you want to know what's really going on for real in the world, you you can go look at a Gartner report. Of course, for the very great reports they provide, they, they charge for those, but they make a lot of stuff available freely on the internet. To, we'll talk about this incredibly powerful growth curve. It's not growing like, you know, like this one thing growing up or two things growing up. It's like all these things growing, you know, together in parallel. And that's what Stuart is saying about the different opportunities in cloud computing. You used to just pick, oh, I'm going to go into computer science. Okay, well, that's this right here. And then you're going to go cloud. And that was that like there. Now I'm going to go to application development and big data processing and all the other things as well. So just understanding all of the different options, it takes a little bit of effort, mostly so you can figure out what you are attuned to. What, what thing do you feel like you could be good at? Because no one's really good at, at all of these things. You might be able to do a fair amount of them, but you want to start toning it down at some point. And that's, so our, the, that's our transition into the discussion about the careers. Perfect. Yeah. So, so yeah, so you have all of these. So can you, can you go off and do a little bit of research to find out what you're good at? Can you hop on a cloud and try different things out and say, is this for me or not? So the first category for a lot of people is a cloud engineer. And a cloud engineer would work on the infrastructure of cloud computing. Used to be the guy, even, even like me, I used to have to go into freaking data centers and sit there and listen to the, to the air conditioning run for eight hours a day, ruined my hearing, this horrible environment, and sit in there and make the computers work, make them talk to each other, make them share data. Now you just sit back in the comfort of your home or your office on your laptop and you're a cloud engineer allocating resources in a virtual environment, a virtual world. So you would allocate that, then you hand off the work to the next group of people, which is the cloud developer. And so a lot of times these two categories Sometimes they'll merge, but a lot of times they're completely separate where a developer is going to know how to take software that they'd like to write. They're going to take the tools they'd like to use like Visual Studio or VS Code or, 
or Eclipse in the Java world uh, or PySpark in the Spark world. And they learn, use those tools well to create applications very frequently locally and then deploy them out to the various clouds. So once they're out in the clouds, of course, now someone's got to know how to keep them working from the point of view of, can I get that set of resources that you just built and that solution you built in the hands of my business users? So the cloud administrators make sure security is right. Big, big category of knowledge is, is cloud security. A data management, data architecture, master data management are all words that directly relate to the people who focus in on data engineering. So there's like security, there's data engineering, there's application development, there's DevOps. And you probably all know about DevOps. DevOps is super hot because it drops the cost of doing software development maintenance way down if you do it right. And of course, to do it right, you have to have a little bit of knowledge about what the tools are and how to use them. So there's a lot of different um, skill sets involved that are directly related. You can kind of bounce around a little bit and then you can focus in on one. So one of the ones that you get to after you've bounced around a little bit, which is what I was primarily doing, is cloud architecture. And that means that you're going and you're listening to the business user, you're looking at the legacy platform, you're thinking a bit, you're saying, how could I take that and make it work better in cloud? And then like a building architect, you would build up the scaffolding, which is all the infrastructure, build up the software as a service as appropriate, because you can't pay for everything to be developed. And you put it all together and then you hand it off to the database administrator and say, here's the scaffolding. Mr. DBA, could you come and make sure all the data is correct, it's secure, it's accessible. Um, if you've got a master data management strategy, let's make sure we implement that. And, and then once you got those, then you can go walking over to the DevOps guy and say, look, I need to have a prototype. I need to have a proof of concept that this is gonna work. And I want you to pick the language, Java, C Sharp, Python, R Scala, whatever it is. And I want you to develop something to prove it works. And then we're gonna go give it to the cloud security team. And they usually they'll have one or more cloud security engineers that make sure that all the other three people are doing things the right way. Because it's pretty easy to cut corners and try to make it work. Because honestly, a lot of courses, including the ones I teach, that's what I tell you to do. Just make it work. Then once you have it working properly, secure it because trying to build the security at the same time causes things to not work a lot of times. So you can design security in at the beginning as you should, and then you give it to the security guy and he'll go around and check the periphery, check all the attack surfaces, they call them attack surfaces for vulnerabilities. And if he finds them, he'll report it back to the cloud DBA, the cloud architect, the DevOps engineer and say, okay, you need to polish these areas because there's a little bit of, of, a, of a hole here. And then you go off and do that. So the, this group, the PUC here, all end up working together. Sometimes in really small companies, it's the same person, which if you can avoid that, do. Because trying to do all of this with one person is not easy. Uh, but boy, would you learn a lot if you were doing it. So there's a lot of different related technologies. What wasn't on that slide was the analyst person then that analyst person is the person that goes in and looks at all the data, figures out how to make it meaningful to a company like a company like LinkedIn, for example. So, and, and LinkedIn would say, well, you know, we, we developed a fair amount of these cloud architectures. We develop a lot of the technologies being used. And then they can go through and then now utilize it a whole lot better. So you can pop back to the LinkedIn slide. Um, so the, the, the LinkedIn, so when they say we're developing things, well, they're developing things and then they have to deploy them globally. This is a big company. So they're saying that LinkedIn was 213,000 cloud openings in the USA uh, as March, 2023. And I believe that. I mean, I've been, on LinkedIn, I've been on LinkedIn since it was created pretty much. And it's just it's grown tremendously. The number of jobs have grown tremendously. Uh, company, countries like India, country, um, actually almost every other country, they're, uh, growth pattern in the area of cloud computing is huge because it just makes sense. The business people who make the monetary decision of how to spend money to keep track of data and applications realize that in most cases, a cloud strategy is the most cost effective. So the growth of it is expected to be through the ceiling, 23% through 2025. And if you go and if you go listen to the vendors who sell all this stuff, they'll tell you pretty much the same thing. They're, they're, they're like this. And by the way, sales is another good job. I've, had, I've been a sales support engineer 
in my past as well, where you need to go in and the business is not quite sure what they should do, if it's safe or not, they should spend money. So all this cloud growth means that somebody's making a decision to invest in their cloud strategy. So it's really fun to take some basics and go talk to them. And the reason I bring up the sales team is once you've got a good overview of things, it's a really great place to kind of fine tune and own that because you usually talk about a lot of different things when you're looking into the, the growth aspect of cloud, which would include sales. And you can't be ignorant of the technologies and the companies. You got to know what's going on. So like all the companies you see on this slide, they all hire. I mean, I've, I've worked with and, and known people, pretty much everyone that's on that slide list. So IBM, for example, I know for a fact, IBM, when they're looking for things, they like to get interns. They like to get people who are, are excited about the technology, able to express themselves clearly and understand how to take a problem and do a bit of a problem solving, pass the problem back. Uh, I've had great, great work with, uh, with IBM. The same thing with um, Accenture and Deloitte, the two big uh, six accounting companies. Uh, worked with them. Uh, I've used them as consulting uh, companies and businesses I've been working with. And what they bring to the table usually is, again, people who they've, they've gone and vetted out, cross-trained into the way they do things in the cloud space and make sure they knew how to, to talk about it. So if your expertise is going to be big data, your expertise is going to be cloud architecture, they, they typically will have you hone in on one thing until you're pretty good at talking about it. And then they involve you in their, in their um, businesses with their, their customers. Same thing with Tata over from India Tech Mahindra. These are companies that were fairly small 10 years ago. I don't know if small is the right word, but they weren't humongous like Deloitte and Accenture. And they've, they've been great inroads into providing services globally. So I've used those folks. Oracle goes without saying is all over the place and so is Infosys. So we pros the one I haven't used as much, but in either case, the point is these companies, they know, they know they're not gonna go out and get a senior architect or a senior database administrator all the time. Sometimes they'll get that role, but a lot of times they know they're gonna to have to start at the beginning bring a team, develop, invest in them, and grow them up. So they're looking for people who are excited. They're looking for people who know how to say what they want, where they want to go. And that is one of the things you want to get. But you're going to take a Simply Learn course. I almost always encourage the students to go off, find someone to peer with, and sell them on what you just learned. You'll be boring as heck if you do it at a party. So don't do it at a party. But get, you know, if you get together and you can share stories back and forth about how things work, debate back and forth about whether it's good or bad. Excellent. And these, all these companies on this page would like that. I can tell you that with certainty. So then you say, well, where can I make the most money? Everybody wants more money than you know, they're making today. So the, 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 uh, you'll find different salary averages in the USA, India, the UK, uh, all the European, blah, blah, blah. This particular one is for the USA. And as you can see, it's kind of broken down from entry to senior level. Um, I will say that since I've been a hiring manager at more one of the companies that I've looked at, those are pretty accurate. You know, the entry level, an entry, I, I had a student that I, I worked with when I was doing some, some uh, teaching at a local university just because I wanted people, I needed smart people. So I, I offered to teach some free seminars on cloud on the company I was working with at the time. I wasn't really there to try to teach per se. I was hunting and I found two or three people. I said, these guys are sharp. They're engaged. I give them things to do. They go read it. They research it. They come back. So I managed it out of that one session of people, maybe 30 people were in that group. I managed to directly hire as interns at an 80K level or higher, four of them, four of them for four different kinds of roles because I was looking for people that were, in, were engaged. And that was one of the ways to find them. So for yourselves, that's, you want to make sure you get yourself out there because that's the entry level. The cloud developer is a little bit lower because you're just you're doing software development and that will get you where you want to go eventually if you look at the senior pricing range for that, but it's not going to be as high as a cloud engineer or a cloud architect. So, but you can bounce around as well. I've been personally a cloud engineer. I've been cloud developer and I've been cloud architect. Now, when you can choose between all three, you tend to, Settle on the one that makes the most money and is most fun for you. 
So if you look at the senior numbers out there, are those achievable? Uh, at least right now in the current market space, they, they definitely are. The 271 for a cloud architect is, is on the high end, I will say that. But there are high end jobs out there for people with 10, 15 years in architecture, some business acumen, and that architect has often done the cloud engineer job and cloud developer job. So they understand what's necessary, how to mentor other people into developing the kind of platform that you're looking to do. So all the numbers on this chart, I think are pretty realistic and they, they're something that you should aspire towards. And by, if you do get something a little lower as an entry level, you got to weigh, what am I going to get out of it? Yep, so now I'm done with that one. So that, that's a, a lot of things to think about when you go through that. The, the up-to-date skills, <clears throat> what's kind of good about this job, if you train to be an accountant when you're 20, you'll be an accountant when you're 60. And you might learn some new things, but you're still going to be an accountant. If you get in to be a cloud practitioner or anything in cloud, it used to be that in the computer industry, you were, const you were constantly learning. You're going to learn uh, Fortran, then you're going to learn COBOL, and you're going to lose Assembler, then C, object-oriented analysis and design, and that was your path. There weren't a whole lot of variants. Now there's a lot of variants. I mean, like I said before, they're all over the place. So up-to-date skills in how to pick a cloud. Again, when you're studying cloud architecture or cloud uh, in terms of AWS or Azure or whichever one it is, what, what's, what's, the thing, what's the thing that that cloud is good at? What's the thing that that cloud is not as good at? So selecting the proper cloud and the cloud architecture on top of that. Application migration is huge. I've spent at least three different contracting terms doing nothing more than application migration. How do I safely get your application set into cloud? Performance testing is a part of all of that. And cloud workloads, understanding how to allocate enough power in the cloud to get what you need done accomplished is a big, is a big thing, an important task <clears throat> that's going to affect the actual cost. Uh, identity access management is just cloud security, right? So cloud security, if you've if you, if you got that hacker mentality, you like to see how things work, great place to go, highly in demand. Um, the auto scaling functions. A lot of companies are not as good at auto scaling as they should be. You know that means that you allocate a little tiny bit of compute, and then on you know Christmas Eve when the, the ecom things are going crazy, it scales up by itself. That's an important skill to have. A little bit weak in my experience in a lot of different areas. Another area that's huge is disaster recovery. Usually that's an afterthought, and for the companies that make it an afterthought and the experience of disaster. You know, it's not an afterthought any longer, but that's a big one. Web services and standardization and APIs, another important category. If you're a developer and you like to mess around with code, you already know what web services are and you know, you know what APIs are. Those are not an afterthought. You have to think of those ahead of time so that you know how you're going to scale them out. And the same thing with the, the, last, the last ones there, cloud migration, deployment, database management. Uh, storage services, that multi-cloud deployment is a special case. That means that you're going to use the best of Azure, the best of AWS, the best of GCP. So, and you need to know what those are. So that was, uh, I'll pass it back to Stuart and, and uh, see if he's got any, any comments. I, I, Zoom just kicked me off for a moment. So if you wanted to finish up on, on this slide. Yeah, I'm done with that one. I, I, thought, okay. you wanted, I thought you wanted to chat. Uh, I'm going. I haven't I haven't taught for a few days, so I've got lots to say. <laughs> it's 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 that Zoom sometimes has issues with uh, with me, so it kicks me off briefly, but brings me back on. Okay, well we're good. Yeah, so this this particular slide is really important because you're saying, well, what am I going to learn? What am I? What do I need to learn? What do I want to focus on? And when I'm teaching a class like on, on any of these different topics, one of the first things I, I let everybody know is I'm going to tell you the things that you need to focus on because in any course, there's the core juicy little pieces that you kind of need to know. And then there's a fair amount of fluff and you, can't, you need to know a little bit about the fluff, but not a lot. And so how are you going to make that determination? So this slide helps point out some things that are, it, there's no fluff on this slide. So if you're going to be learning cloud, for example, then you need to know about the compute area of Amazon EC2. You need to know how it works, how to deploy. You should be able to go to a console, spin up a virtual machine, access it, and run an app because that's a basic core skill. 
The same thing with doing a basic attached to a database of some sort. It doesn't have to be Amazon's DynamoDB. There's lots of other ones out there, but that's a really good one to start with. Good support does a lot of different uh, functionality. And then as you're using compute, you'll go, you might go looking around the, the, the slide there. As you're using compute, you might go, but it's expensive to use EC2. Well, it is, yeah. So what if I just use compute when I, just when I need it? I only want to pay for running this little application right here when I run it. I'm going to run it twice an hour. Great. We'll use AWS Ant Lambda for that because that way you're not going to go off and allocate a computer, build it out, deploy it, and pay for it forever. You're only going to use the Lambda compute when you need it. Important concept. Then I need to store the output somewhere so you know where to store it. On Amazon, it's S3. On Azure, it's Blobs. So it depends on where you are at as to how you're going to store things. You need to know about that as well. And then over on the right-hand side there, you've got a lot of technologies that are pretty important. The Azure, re this that's obviously on the Microsoft platform. Actually, all three of those are. So the Azure resource manager that will help you manage the utilization, tracking, and billing of all these services that you're using. Then the Azure container services, which is a, a kind of a step between an EC2 and a Lambda. It means I've got, I've got a container, I'm gonna put compute in that container and I'm gonna keep that container busy all the time. And when something breaks, I want it to automatically fix itself. Pretty powerful. So as you might guess, understanding containers is an important basis. And then the last one is just Azure and Azure uh, domain naming services, how to build it, how to deploy it, how to make sure all your tools can talk to each other globally. And that would be more the area of cloud networking cloud engineering, but a subcategory cloud networking. Also pretty exciting to, to get involved in. Uh, and then where it says, and many more, or if you go to the AWS homepage or the Azure homepage and you click on the services available, oh my God, there's hundreds of them in there. <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's, it's definitely a lot of services that you can get. Yeah, I'm good on this one, Stuart. All right, so we've gotten to the point now where we can, uh take questions from the audience stop sharing and see what we've got right now there's one question in the q a so i encourage everybody to to add more but this first one from roger um i am currently a network engineer ccna and a ccnp uh, what would be recommended to become a cloud engineer yeah, do you want me to take a first stab at that? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. Well, since I used to teach NetWare for quite a long time, um, A, good good on you, because that's not an easy course to get through. But what you want to do is your knowledge base when you're a NetWare or a Microsoft.net engineer, either one of those two, is to take that transition that into cloud. That, that cloud engineering is more on the area of architecture as relates to building virtual networks deploying the compute and storage resources that you need. So Azure Fundamentals or AWS Fundamentals, Associate Architect would be, would be areas to focus on as well. That's gonna be almost a direct correlation to what you already know. So that makes it easier to step into cloud. I and mean, once you're sitting on that perch of looking at engineering, then you can look around and see if there's something else that's more interesting to you. Okay, thank you. Um, Sanjana, I saw you raised your hand. If you would put your question into the Q&A, we'll, we'll take that. And Meantime, from the chat, um, Arquita, uh, I am a networking student planning on taking AWS certified cloud protection or certification. What would I do next after that? How can I get into more deeply into cloud computing? That's a loaded question. What? What? what um, I I don't see that written anywhere. What was the where is he right now? Uh, he is a networking student and looking to take AWS uh, Certified Cloud Practitioner for, as a certification, but what path can he follow next to go oh, deeper? Yeah, yeah. Well, the good news is the practitioner class is going to get you kind of a broad-based overview of what L is in cloud at, the, at a basic core level. So the, the challenging part there is because you started off with networking, you don't know, maybe you, you weren't interested in data. You might be more interested in software development. You might be more interested in uh, project management, which I see one of the other questions is. There's a lot of different things that you can then look at once you're in that space. The best thing to do is to talk to other people in your class, talk to the instructor, 
and figure out what what you're interested in because there's there's all these there's all these different paths from that practitioner level and you really kind of need to decide do i want to be a date dba if you don't like databases then don't go do that um, if you like networking and virtual networking you want to be a cloud engineer also a security engineer also someone who do, who specifies and deploys software as a service technology in your company so there's a lot of different things that that you can launch off to with that practitioner um, certification that you can then become you can become deeper cloud architecture is the logical next one associate architect and architect mm -hmm. and that leads into peter's question from the chat he was curious to know what is the process and how long does it take to get into the cloud architect position the useful resources so uh, you said Peter. I, don't, I guess. I oh, it's know. over in the chat. Uh, his question literally is: Please, how long does it take to become a cloud architect? <laughs> I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with everybody, including myself. Um, you know, it depends on the level of knowledge. A cloud architect is someone who knows all different components that you can use to build up a solution in the cloud. So the it, it's going to take you the time it takes you to go through those courses, whatever that is. Usually couple of three months at the very least. And then, then the time it takes to kind of in, 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 in incorporate key technologies into your thought process and probably apply them to a, a problem or a solution that you're developing for a company. So, and that might take another year or two. Now, if you just want a, a job as, an, almost nobody in my experience would hire someone who's relatively new as an architect. Because the the the, the, broad, the breadth of knowledge is is pretty pretty broad, but they would hire an an, uh, an intern cloud engineer who wants to be an architect. So you would want to take on the skills of the cloud engineer, directly try to implement some of the solutions, and then speak about them in terms of the architecture, and that'll get you going where you where you want to go. And you can pick any little any little pieces that the company needs to get you in that path. You basically need experience to become an architect. Right. Uh, Jean-Philippe, uh, I think you touched on this, but what is the most important cloud service? AWS, Google Cloud, Azure? <laughs> uh, you know, just for Stuart, just for Stuart, I wouldn't normally, I'm going to do this anyway. So from I get that question all the time in the classes, right? So, and at the companies. So each of the clouds has strengths and they, each of the clouds has weaknesses. So there is no one cloud that's better than the other, except for the exception of two. AWS and Azure both are probably better at enterprise deployments than Google. So GCP is a big data, ML, machine learning, uh, AI kind of a platform. They do have other technologies, but the, 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 oftentimes they're the third cloud in the multi-cloud environment right. or the second cloud. If you're a Microsoft environment and your legacy platform all around you is all this Microsoft SQL Server, Active Directory services, Windows is everywhere, and you want to migrate to cloud easily and quickly and slowly, I don't want to do some, some you know, punch and switch, Azure is the best one, in my opinion. But that's because I've used the different clouds and Microsoft has tools and technology that just makes it easier for you to migrate to cloud. You can do it in AWS, and, you and I actually have done it in AWS, but if I had to pick, I'd pick Azure. Now, if I'm a brand new startup and I want to use the best of everything, I'm probably going to pick AWS. So it's it's it you know you know why you like certain things and why you you don't. That's the main story there. Don't go and say, hey, Azure's better. Kick AWS's butt. Don't, don't go do that. Yeah. Um, we have Jayesh, who's a BCA student in India. What course do you recommend for cloud computing? Uh, we actually have some recommendations for you at, at the end, um, so we'll, we'll be touching on that, uh, Jayesh. We're going to be talking about one of the courses that's offered in the U.S., but we have an, an analogous course that we offer in uh, India and the rest of the world as well. So, um, <clears throat> Dijvijay uh, says, I'm a PMO person. Where can Scrum Masters, Project Managers, Program Managers fit into space how do those skills apply within cloud yeah yeah i'm 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 so glad you asked that because one of the first things i i need and i require when i get into a project or i'm going to be in a project 
I want a good PMO. I absolutely do. You, you get a bunch of techie nerds in a room. They can't, you know, they can't screw a light bulb in, you know, pretty much by themselves. You need a good PMO. And a good PMO takes the time to understand the underlying base technology. So they're not an expert, but they've taken Azure fundamentals or AWS fundamentals, or if they're a big data project, you know, they know what the terminology in big data space is. They know what the, the, the big components are. So if you're a PMO, you have to pick an area of technology that you're going to become knowledgeable about and take the entry level classes for that, build that together as, as a part of your story so that you can say you're going to participate in the uh, solutioning as you help manage moving it forward. That'd be my short answer to that. As a techie nerd, I take exception to your characterization, but the problem with techie nerds and, and screwing in light bulbs is that uh, the project management person will tell the techie nerd, you really can't spend eight hours figuring out the optimum way to screw in that light bulb. You've got to yeah. you know, <laughs> pick pick one that works and, and move on. So that, that's yeah, yeah. Balance. I'll agree with you. I'll agree with you, Stuart. See, that's how that's how this works. I, I don't agree with everything said, but I do the principle I do. But we both understand that sometimes the techie guy just wants to get it perfect. And I don't need perfect. I just need it to work for the business. That's the PMO's job. Yep. And if everybody understands that, then you, then you get along swimmingly. So uh, anyway, yeah. sorry for the jibe there, Stuart. <laughs> uh, Peter asks a great question, which is what are the relationships between data science and cloud computing? Yeah, so uh, again, this is all opinion, right? I, I could probably go Google something and read something to you, but basically the data scientists in general are a newer add to a lot of businesses. They're, they're typically expensive, which is good for you if you want to be one because they get paid pretty well if you're good at what you do. You have a short lifespan. Once you're a data science and you, scientist and you come into a, a company that's got a whole bunch of tableaus for doing the analytics, they got big data clusters, and they want to leverage all that, they're going to give you this much time to produce something useful. Well, you need this much time a lot of times. So being a data scientist, you have to be able to explain why this amount of time isn't going to be good enough. You need this amount of time. So in other words, a business usually says <coughs> it takes 10 hours to deploy a new compute instance in such and such cloud, right? They'll do the same thing to the data scientist who's Guys, head full of analytics, and they they un understand all the different permutations of the of the algorithms that are going to get used in, in a machine language application to deploy this great answer. But they realize it's going to take them a year to get it right. So you have to ask them and yourself, are you going to really have that year? So it's it's incredibly important, and you have to get some salesmanship skills, and you need to fine tune rapid delivery to meet the requirements of the business, even if it's uncomfortable. So that would be my answer. Okay. Tendai uh, in the chat asks, I'm busy preparing for AWS Certified Solutions Architect. Can you please recommend some useful resources in preparation for this? And if you look at the simplylearn.com website, you'll find a number of resources that are tied specifically to prep for that course, for that certification. Um, so here's Hillary who asks for advice uh, from the background of being desktop support for almost eight years, would a pivot to cloud computing or a pivot to data analysis be better? Well, I've worked with a lot of desktop support people. I'm assuming you're one of the better ones if you've been thinking about this. So a desktop support person's primary skills is they are willing to dig into things that other people don't want to dig into. Uh, they have to go do some side research to figure out what patch is required to fix this problem. And you got to have good interpersonal skills typically. So those are the kind of things you would want. So if you're going to move that into, into cloud, you're going to end up focusing on the more technical aspects of those things because there's almost no job in entry level cloud that's got the interpersonal relationship stuff built into it. It's mostly, do you understand how to solve this problem using these tools? So I would probably do, you know, do the, a cloud engineering transition where either cloud engineering or data, again, you gotta decide if you, if you like pulling data into a spreadsheet and analyzing it and figuring out what it means, think about the data path. 
if you if you like building up little tools and wiring things together then the engineering path so i can't answer that specifically other than by saying that yeah. you, so I, I would probably default to the cloud engineering one yeah. um we had a couple last questions wilder asks can you become an architect without going to university of course almost all the good architects that i know including me i've been to university i didn't did i graduate not really um so well i did i did but it wasn't in a technical it wasn't in a technical space yeah, so I yeah so all of almost all of my training was either self-done or it was done through jobs i inserted myself into i was lucky enough to get a, available and leverage them as much as i could learned as much as i could understood and cared about the business requirements a lot of techies go into the little office and they just want to play what you got to do is you got to leave your little office, go off and meet with the marketing people, the salespeople, the CIO, the business line of business owners, understand their problems and their issues. If you do, that will enhance your skills as an architect. Because now when you speak, people will listen because they know that you're not going to blah, 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 every, you know, in unintelligible sentence that you know. And that's another thing to prove that you're going in that path. Try to minimize all the tech techno speak that you end up learning as you go through all of this. Put English words on each thing. If you're gonna learn cloud to architecture, learn the, Am the Azure one. If you look at the AWS one, they have all sorts of weird names for weird things that don't mean anything to anybody. If you go the Azure route, they've named everything by what it really is doing. So the first terminology set I would learn would be the Azure terminology set, knowing that Kinesis and Elastic Beanstalk isn't going to mean anything if you bring it up in a business meeting, right? So that's that's my advice to you. Okay. Um, and then I think what we'll take as the last question here um, is we have uh, Ashodi asks to be, uh, to, let me state the question. I am currently transitioning into tech and looking to reskill by taking on cloud computing. I'd like to know if cloud practitioners require knowledge of coding. Secondly, what's the available support post training? So, if you could take that first one, what, what yeah, uh, coding knowledge does the cloud person need? That's that's a hot one, and it's one of my favorite things to bash on. So, I hear I see all sorts of older style programs that try to teach people Java, for example. Well, if someone who's a cloud engineer or security or desktops or any of those things, if you're not a programmer, Java is not a good thing to do because it's gonna, it's gonna hurt your brain. If you wanna learn a little bit about coding, if you wanna learn a little bit what it means to create an application and call an API, use a tool like Python. Python is, is predominant in a lot of architectures. It's huge in big data. It's huge in just developing little easy to use programs. And the concepts are all based on the same ones you got in Java and the same ones you got in .NET. So you could transition later if you want to. So I would start with something like Python, minimize the impact of that and see, well, can I just learn basic scripting skills? Yes, can you script in Python? Yes, you can. So, so you can use PowerShell and Bash and Python all together. So you're gonna learn a little scripting in most of this technology, cloud engineering or whatever, pick a language that's not gonna, you know, it hurt your brain unless you want to be a programmer. If you want to be a programmer, one of the .NET, Java, or Ruby on Rails, any of those are, are good. There's a lot of them. I'm not going to go into those right now, but there's a lot of languages you could go down that path. Most people who come to a seminar like this, though, want to do the work. They want to do the architecture. They want to build and deploy databases. They want to do extract, transfer loads on databases, clean it up so that they can use it in their business services and so on. So I would say I would say Python. I, I recommend everybody at least do the basics of Python. It'll tell you if you like it or don't like it. At least do a little basics. Simply Learn makes a, I think a free version of the Python training available for I think it's anybody. So you can just go do that, and then you can talk to your educational resource person, and they can tell you how to extend that outwards. <clears throat> but you would use that in almost any of the cloud-based courses. And uh, generally speaking, in, in all of our bigger programs, which I'll speak about one of them in a moment, um, any coding that you need to learn how to do is included in the, the curriculum for the program. So uh, unless it says that you have to come in with a particular set of skills, that will be part of the 
training that you receive. Um, and we'll also mention briefly when I talk about that program, some of the post training support that you get in terms of uh, uh, job search support and that type of thing. So, um, Misty, I, have, I see your question, and you'll hear about the answer to that, your question having to do with uh, hands-on experience in, in cloud tools. You'll hear about that in just a moment as I go into it. So with that, I'm going to wrap up the Q&A, and I'll move back into the presentation, and we'll talk about one of the programs that Simply Learn offers. Here's my slideshow. Again, if I get kicked off for sharing, I will be back. Well, I still see you. Thank you. By the way, thanks for all the great questions, too, by the way. I, I appreciated that. Yeah, the, the, our audience today has a lot of keen interest and a lot of great questions. So we're very, very pleased to have the interaction with you folks. Um, and here's our question for you, um, the first of several. What is stopping you from taking that step to get certified in cloud computing? Um, if you've looked at other programs, why haven't you done them? Uh, is it because you can't find one that covers uh, uh, all of the skills that Greg described? Is it one because you don't think you'd end up with the uh, practical hands-on experience to demonstrate your, your skills? Um, is it because the learning style doesn't fit you, learning from pre-recorded videos? And is it because you don't find the time in your work schedule to make time for um, training and education? So let me, you were hearing from Greg's dog earlier. You may be hearing from my cat right now. Um, let me end the poll here, share the results. And the main issue that most people have is feeling that they would get practical exposure, worrying that you wouldn't have the practical experience at the end of the program to show off your new skills, as well as finding comprehensive programs and finding the time to do them. So I'm just going to briefly mention this program. This is one of many, and this is one that we do in conjunction with Caltech, which is one of the world's leading universities. Caltech has a Center for Technology Management Education, which trains people in industry on uh, technology and management skills, and they've chosen us as their delivery partner for the Cloud Computing Boot Camp. This program is based in the United States. We have a different version that is for India and the rest of the world that covers a similar curriculum, but is a bit longer. Well, the, this program has uh, pretty liberal requirements. I'll talk about that in a moment. And this covers a fully comprehensive curriculum with the hands-on lab. You do them in a sandboxed environment on the same digital learning platform. So all you need is a, a machine that has a web browser, laptop or a desktop to do most of your work. You can access some of the materials on your mobile device. if you want. Self-teaching videos in preparation for your live classes. You get live instruction trainers who will take you through the, the exercises. Usually those are weekend classes, so they don't interfere with your work. Um, you can see here, this is the structure of the program, starting with an induction session that teaches you uh, what you're going to learn, how to use the platform. Then it takes you through AWS, uh, a couple modules in AWS, and how to use that and design and implement solutions there. Then a couple modules on Azure, taking you through implementation and management of that platform. And then um, on the Azure platform, you've chosen to use that for the infrastructure module. A final phase of this program is a capstone project where you build a solution to an industry-based uh, cloud computing challenge. And it would be the type of problem that you might be expected to, to work on as a working cloud uh, engineer, and you get to build that solution. It goes into your portfolio, along with all the other projects you've done in the course, as your practical experience. So you get hands-on experience with all the tools, and then get to show what you did 
to any potential future employer or to your current employer to get a better position. Along the way, you can take um, no extra cost. The master classes from Caltech instructors, which are fascinating, uh, take some deeper looks into some of the subjects. So you can come into this program, this particular program, the boot camp, um, again, a US-based program. You can come in as a high school graduate, uh, 18 years of age or older. You do not need a programming background. You will learn any coding skills that you need on the uh, during the program you also don't have to have work experience international version does require that you have a bachelor's degree so it's a slightly different program but for this one for us and, and north america south america learners no bachelor's degree required how much experience do our, our audience members have i'm going to ask this question real quick Just to get a feel for who's still in school, who's been in the workforce for some time. I'll just leave this open for about 10 seconds. I'll close it in five, four, three, two, one. So about half of our audience are people still working on their degrees, and the other half are people with work experience again that pretty much tells you that nearly everybody here i think is qualified to take this program from the educational experience point and i want to share with you a couple of brief testimonials from jorge who um, finished the course three weeks later got hired as a cloud engineer um, doubled his salary. Um, Mario has gotten much more attention from recruiters from, from that course. And you were mentioning, a, a, not on the cloud course, but on a different course, Greg, you mentioned that a couple of your students got job offers while they were in the program. <laughs> I thought I wasn't supposed to talk about it. Yeah. <clears throat> no, no, I mean, it's, 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 no, a, no, it's, it's funny. It's funny. I, I, of the students I had, more than half of them got jobs in the space within probably about the first two months of the program. And it's not just because of that, it's because the people who are taking a class like this are investing in themselves. And a lot of employers, they, they figure that out. That's a good thing to bring up during an interview. Yeah. And in talking about your experiences, which I emphasize with these guys, so they would talk, I would say, take the stories that I'm telling you that you're learning right now and make them your own stories, because that's what's gonna help you get a, a, a job. So anyway, so they got, they got jobs right away. One of them, as uh, Stuart pointed out, one of them more than doubled his salary. And it was just like over the moon. Uh, he continued in the, in the program. And, and one of the ones I'm doing now, they're just finishing up. But both people who are now left, one of them has a new job and is plugging along. The other one's job won't start until he's actually done with this program. But that, those are both amazing, amazing outcomes. And uh, it's just when you do sign up, Make sure you let the instructor will be telling you things and sharing probably stories and so on. Write those down, right? Make those your own, make those your own stories. Add that to your experience somehow so that when you, you get asked a question along those lines, you don't say, I'm researching it or I'm studying it right now. Tell the story. So that's what I'm going to encourage you to do is make sure that you, you take as much as you can from the training program. Also, and, and that touches that leads into the advice about the, the job assist services that are part of this boot camp um, for learners who are in the North America. Um, you get everybody who works with Simply Learn gets uh, you know, the, the projects, the portfolio of things that you've done in the courses and capstones that you get to take with you. Um, you also all get access to webinars that we do regularly to. Uh, help you in, in staying sharp technically and, and with career skills and, and job search skills. Um, specifically for US learners with this program, and we have a version for India learners with our international programs, you get job assist services, which give you exclusive job openings. So that extends for six months after you complete that program. So quick question here, two parts. Um, and are you 
interested in enrolling in this program potentially? And if so, when? We'll just leave this open for another 10 seconds. Get a chance to hit submit. I will close it in five, four, three, two, one. To end the poll and share the results with you. I'm looking at three quarters of you are interested, and uh, more than half of you who are interested like to do either uh, maybe in cohort that we would start next month or the next couple of months. So that's great. And do reach out to us at ask us at simplylearn.net. I'm going to put that into the chat right now. Make that available to everybody. Hold on for just a second as I look. I do want to tell you that if you um, enroll after this session, we have a special bonus offer for you. You'll get more information about that in our follow-up email, but it's a substantial discount on the boot camp program. So if you are eligible for our North American program, um, mention that to you. Now in the chat, you can access the email address and the URL for our program. So the program fee is $9,999. You get a $500 discount. For Oops, the next cohort starts uh, with classes in May and next week is the uh, uh, orientation session and you are going to see me drop off and drop back on again. I'm just going to have one last question for you. <laughs> OK, one last question for you. Let's get to that. Oops. There we go. And that last question is, uh, would you like us to reach out to you and help you um, learn about getting enrolled? Would you like, uh, would you, if you want a, a proof of attendance for this particular webinar, so that you were here today, we can also send that to you. So if you answer yes, we can do that but also answer yes if you'd like us to reach out and tell you more about the program, help you get enrolled. And we'll leave this open for about 15 seconds longer. Oops, what happened? Hold on a second, I hit the wrong button. I apologize for being so ham fisted today. One moment. All right. Here we go. Apologize for that. If you could answer that question, I'll give it about 20 seconds. Close in about five, four, three, two, one. 
and it's a 50 50 split so for those of you who answered yes we will be reaching out to you and uh, sending you a proof of attendance helping you with questions about the program i want to thank you all for being here uh, i want to thank greg for his knowledge his expertise his time and his patience really appreciate that greg yep no problem thanks for having me and I want to thank everyone in our audience. The QR code will take you to the program page on our website. And you can, of course, contact our learning consultants at askus at simplylearn.net. We hope that we can welcome you into the Caltech and Simply Learn learning community. And please go to the website. Um, you can navigate from there to other resources about cloud computing um, and delve into everything that we have available for you. So if you're not in the United States, if you're in India, Africa, Asia, Europe, uh, anywhere in the world, you'll see other offerings that we have available in your local area. We operate in 150 countries worldwide. So we, again, hope we can welcome you into our learning community. That concludes our webinar for today.